Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm here with a pickleball player that no one from Ben Johns to Anna Lee Waters wants to see in their side of the draw. A former pro tennis player who reached top 130 in the world in doubles. He collects medals like he's running a scrap business. He has a 6.6 .6 duper in both singles and doubles. He's from Romania, a pro pickleball player since 2017. Andre Dascu, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, my pleasure being here, Aaron. That's, uh, that's quite the intro, actually. Um... Remind me to pay after this. <laughs> I like to set a high bar, you know. You sure do. You sure do. So this past weekend at the APP Atlanta Open, which you've just been, you know, dominating throughout the APP lately, you and Rob Nunnery won the men's doubles final against Greg Dow and Anderson Scarpa, 11-0, 11-0. So my first question is, have you ever won a final 0-0? Uh, and how did that happen? Um... To be honest with you, I don't really keep track of it. I, I would venture out to say we probably never won a final 11-0, 11-0. Um, how did it happen? I mean, just it's kind of like the perfect storm. Uh, both Rob and I came out firing. Uh, we're both very hot from the start. Uh, obviously, Greg and Anderson weren't anywhere near their best. Um, we were able to make some good runs at a pretty quick first game. Uh, then jumped out to a big lead in the second game. And, uh, yeah, like I said, it's kind of like the perfect storm. We, we didn't really miss much and we didn't really do anything wrong. And, uh, they weren't playing their best either. So, um, yeah, I ended up being, uh, 11 0 11 0 And, uh, you know, after all the pickleball play this year, I will, I will take it. It's nice to, to win a match like that for sure. How much of playing a great match has to do with playing really well versus just not making any mistakes? Uh, look to to play like that. You obviously have to play very well. I mean, and, and look when you when you're playing very very well, obviously you're not making many mistakes to begin with. But uh, also, it wasn't just consistency that got us there. We we definitely we were speeding up, taking some chances, and it was working out. So uh, it was a combination of being very consistent on the soft game and also being very hot when it comes to the fast game. Yeah, absolutely. So something yeah. that fascinates me. Oh, sorry. I mean, All right. Um, something that, that fascinates me about your game is how consistent you are as a player. You're someone that can dink with anyone forever, barely missing. You never really force early attacks when the opportunity isn't there. So how important is consistency to you? And what skills have you built up to make yourself such a consistent player? Well, consistency is obviously very important, but it's not the only thing. I mean, there's a lot of players who are very consistent. You got to be able to the counter punch you have to have obviously in today's game you have to have some good offense offensive tools as well so uh i try to keep a pretty well around the game and i try to you know continue to improve uh, i don't think there's a there's any way around any shortcuts around repetition so i think that's gonna that's the best way to, to practice it uh putting in the work and putting in the reps um but i do think yeah i do think if if you're not consistent enough you can't really play the game of pick up at the higher levels because the better players are just hard to attack and you're going to have to to have the right soft game and make the right choices to be able to go through them. Otherwise, it's, there's no chance. So, um, yeah, like I said, I think it's a combo of everything, but I think the consistency in the soft game are very important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In addition to your consistent style of play, you've also been consistent in just winning goals almost every tournament you've played lately. Many pro players will have ups and downs, winning streaks and slumps, but you know you really haven't had many slumps lately. How are you able to keep your level of play consistently so high? Oh, I don't. I don't want to jinx it. I I don't take any of the gold medals for granted. I don't. I I'm really you know enjoying the journey. I'm really enjoying the success I'm having. Um, and look, I've been around sports long enough to. To know you have to to continue to ride that wave when you're on it, you know, um, it's not gonna last forever. So, um, definitely very happy with the current results. Definitely very happy with the way I managed to stay consistent throughout the year. Uh, the way I do it, I don't think there's any major secrets to it. You know, I just I try to practice the right amount. I try to listen to my body. I try to do the right amount of conditioning, the right amount of recovery. I try to keep myself as healthy and fit as possible, um, and I try to keep myself obviously in the balance when it comes to to amount of to the amount of pickleball I get to play. So uh super busy schedule this year. If 
everything goes through the way it's supposed to and I'm staying injury free, I'm I'm gonna end up playing a, around thirty to thirty one events, which is obviously uh -huh. a lot. Uh yeah. So uh I think it's really important to 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 take care of everything you have to take care of during those days off and, and kind of keep yourself uh you know fresh mentally, physically and fit obviously. Yeah, absolutely. You're talking about fitness and recovery, you know, for, you know, high level players or even recreational players. Are there any tips you have on how you maintain your body, how you recover that others might be able to take away from? Well, recovery is different, obviously, than conditioning. Uh, when it comes to, to conditioning, there's a lot of stuff you can do on the court uh, without without actually playing. You know, there's a lot of plyometric exercises, a lot of explosiveness, speed stuff that you can do on the court. There's obviously stuff you can do in the gym. There's, there's a lot of running involved as well. Uh, but that takes a toll on your body. So um, you got to manage the load on that. And then when it comes to recovery, I, um, you know, I I, uh, I tend to do a lot of sports massages. I, I try to stretch probably twice a day. Um, I do live in Florida, so training here in this very humid environment, I, I try to probably get an IV once a month or maybe a little more often if I need to. Um, I do use compression pants, you know, for, uh, for recovery and, uh, a couple other things with nutrition that, that I try to do in, in order to just kind of keep my body, you know, in, in top shape and, and keep that recovery time as, as sure as possible because events is not really all the time to, to take care of your body. So you got to be spot on with what you do during those days off and those, uh, days outside competition. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you're uh, in terms of physicality, you are a little bit taller than the average pickleball player. I'm curious your thoughts on what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of being a tall pickleball player? Well, uh, I think the advantages are pretty obvious. You know, the, you got the reach, you know, you, you can take a lot of balls out of the air. Uh, you know, you can you can pressure people when they're trying to drop inside the kitchen. Uh, also, being tall means you have more leverage when you when a counter when you punch back. Um, so those those would be. I mean, I think it's yeah. I think it helps at the start of the point. But again, with the reach, I think it helps in terms of even though you're bigger, so it's more target. It's also harder to attack because you can punch back a little harder maybe than than uh, than a normal person would. Uh, and the disadvantage, I think, are pretty obvious as well, right? You know, you're gonna have you're gonna struggle, you're gonna have trouble with the lower, lower height balls. You know, anything that's gonna bounce, the pickable is known not to bounce too high, uh, and you're gonna have trouble, you know, twisting and turning and bending like a, like someone of a shorter size would do. You know, so agility is obviously a disadvantage, but uh, you, you try to work on those things. There's no, I guess, perfect body for pickable. It's like I don't think there's a perfect body for any sport. So you. You try to take what's given to you and uh, and work on all the other stuff that's not as natural and just be the best you can. Yeah. Um, there's another question I have that I want to ask. I actually, you know, I, I write out a lot of questions, but I, something's coming to my mind that I didn't write out, but I really want to ask uh, that's, okay. that's coming to mind. So, you know, as we talked about even before we started the interview, um, co-founder Matt and myself of the Pickleball Clinic, we played you and Kyle Yates at the U.S. Open uh, second round. You know, we came out in the U.S. Open, we beat a good team first round, felt good, and then absolutely got destroyed by, by you and Kyle. I think it was one and two or something like that. And so, you know, at all levels of, of pickleball or even in athletics, favorites, you know, high level teams that are very confident will sometimes go up against the team that they should absolutely beat very easily. And some players, definitely not yourself, but some players get very, very tense. It's happened to me. I'm playing, you know, we're, let's say, you know, five, five, two, five, four. And it might, we might play some four sixes or four sevens in a tournament and say, we should win this easily, but we actually end up playing bad. How do you keep yourself in a competitive high level mindset, no matter who you're playing, whether it's a close match against a very good opponent or a, a team much worse than you that you should beat very routinely. Cause I know this is something a lot of people struggle with at all levels of the game and at all types of sports. What would your advice be to a, a favorite and, and being able to still win their match regardless who they're playing? Well, I don't think there's such a thing as a, I guess a favorite because you still have to play the game. And if the favorite always won then sports wouldn't be that exciting right so um i think you gotta focus on things you can control which is you and your team um 
I mean, obviously, it matters who you're playing against in terms of the style of play and, you know, the, the things you're going to do to to match their patterns and, and their strengths and all that. But at the end of the day, the focus should still be on you, your own team, and your execution. And I think uh, it, it, in terms of getting nervous, I think everybody gets nervous. I mean, if, if you're not getting nervous, then you should probably see a psychiatrist because something might be wrong with you. You know, I think we're all human. We all get nervous. We all we all feel those emotions during matches. That's kind of what we play the game for. Um, but it, you just kind of have to try to block out the best you can, you know, those things that you can't really control and just focus on the stuff that you can control, which is, again, kind of starts with you. You can definitely control you, what you're thinking, how you're executing and, and all that kind of stuff. And nobody has any control over winning or losing. So um, you can't really think about, oh, I'm up or I'm down or you just want to play the best. You want the next point to be the best point you can play and, and just right. go about it that way. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, that's kind of that's kind of take care of everything else. You, you yeah. can't really manage it too much out there, you know, otherwise you got to drive yourself nuts and end up with a so-called paralysis by analysis, you know, yeah. syndrome. Yeah, you're yeah. thinking too much and you forget how to do it, you know. We, we've all played enough this game. We've all hit millions of shots. So, uh, yeah, you just kind of have to let your instincts take over there and trust yourself with it. Yeah, paralysis by analysis. I like that. Yeah, um, that's, that's been used in a lot of sports. So, it, And it's true, you know, when, you, when you're overthinking it out there, you, you're making it worse. Yeah. Um, are there any specific drills or games you yeah. use when you practice or, or train that you think others might be able to benefit from? Uh, I, you know, I, I think it's situational. I think it depends from player to player. I, I like to watch video of my past matches. You know, usually on my day off, I try to watch some video. Uh, I obviously play the tournament, so I know exactly what I was lacking. I know what I did really well. I know what I didn't do so well. Um, I know what I could improve on. I certain things I learned through that tournament. So that's kind of that's kind of what dictates my my practices and my training for the next week or whatever time I have in between tournaments. Um it's not one specific drill that I say oh, I'll do it every day. You know, it's 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 kind of it's a combination of things. You know, sometimes I have to work in hand speed, sometimes I work in on transition, sometimes I work in drive, sometimes I work in things. You know, it's it's really like I said, kind of what I what I felt like I wasn't doing so well that that week, you know, during a tournament, and then I try to come back to to practice and uh, and work on it and address it, and yeah, hopefully be able to do it better for the next weekend. And it's never the same thing, you know. It's the game is constantly changing. People you play against are different. Locations are different, you know. Some some locations the boat travels faster. Some some it travels slower. The boat is harder. The boat is mushier, depending on temperature and all that. So um, it's hard to really put your finger on one thing. Uh, I I think you should. You should you should be a jack of all trades and really work on your whole game and and have a lot of tricks in your bag. Yeah. How? What's the ratio of drilling versus playing? Like rec drilling versus rec play. I you know I play so many tournaments. I don't really do a lot of rec play. Probably I would say I do rec play maybe once a week, twice a week if I don't have a tournament. You know, I I've played I've played enough matches this year. I've played enough matches throughout my career. Uh, I obviously out of season I I play a lot more rec play but in season right now i'll probably say you know if i have three to four training days before the next tournament i'll probably train and drill three days and then do one game of practice points rec, rec play and stuff like that yeah all right so this next question i have not sure how you feel about um you know giving a full answer on it but i i, I you know i'm curious your thoughts on the, the top five men's doubles players in the world right now outside of you I, I think it's really hard to narrow it to, you know, to the top five because the margins are so small these days. And, you know, you, you see it with what a lot of players, you know, look at look at someone like Jordan. Who's, Jordan Arlo's had so much success on the MLP scene. And and it will be unfair. Like some people say he's not top five. It would be unfair to think of him. I mean, the guy has won about two MLPs. And, it's had some wins over all the better, best players in the world. So it, it, it's really – I think that top five is constantly changing. I think there's a lot of really talented players out there that could be in that top five on any given day. Um, you do have, you know, three players that are extremely consistent, obviously, in uh, in men's doubles, in, uh, in Ben, JW, Riley. Uh, you know, Dylan's been very consistent as well recently. Matt, Rahid has been extremely consistent as well. Uh, again, it, it the results have have changed throughout the year. If you look at the start of the year and you look at 
recent tournaments as well, whether it's tour events, whether it's MLP, you see you see different people at the top over there. So it it's really kind of hard to narrow it down to to just five guys. I think that's the thing these days. The depth is is so big, and there's more and more players coming in, and their upside is huge. So um, that that's what makes it fun as well. You know, makes it entertaining for sure. Yeah. When you think about the wave of new players coming in, the way the pro tours are evolving, even the amount of courts built on the recreational side, what do you think about what comes to mind when thinking about uh, the future of pickleball? Yeah, I think everybody want to have that crystal ball and know where it's going to go. You know, I think, you know, there's a lot of people who who play on the pro tour. There's a lot of people who look at pickleball from a business opportunity standpoint. There's a lot of people who look at pickleball from a teaching opportunity. There's, you know, I, I think that the community is so large these days and it's evolved so much in the last three to five years. Um, it, it's hard to say where the future is going to take it. But I think, I mean, based on the signs we, we're seeing, I think the future is extremely bright. Uh, you see the popularity continuing to increase, whether it's just rec play at the random park, you know, uh, or you're talking about, I don't know, MLP or tour events being live on ESPN. Um, it, it's definitely moving in the right direction. It's growing like crazy. Uh, it's been continuing to grow like crazy for the last, like I said, three to five years. Um, so who knows where, where it's gonna, where it's gonna end up? You know, I, I'm pretty optimistic, and I, again, based on the signs I'm seeing, I think it's, it's gonna continue to grow like this for, for a really long time. And look, it's a really fun game, easy to play, hard to master, so that keeps you coming back. Retention rate for people who have tried the game is probably over 90%. I mean, I rarely run into somebody who plays the game and say, oh, this is not fun. You know, everybody plays the game. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is so much fun. This is great exercise. This is very social. So with all these things in mind, I, I think the only way is up. Yeah, I don't Yeah, I don't see any other way. Yeah, exactly. Definitely only going up. Um, yep. Last couple of questions I have. In, in terms of the growth of sport, another area of growth I wanted to talk about is internationally. So you're from Romania. Um, yes, you know, you're playing a professional sport in America and at the moment it's, it's dominated mostly by Americans. You do have some really successful players, of course, like yourself, um, like Jay Devillier, who, who, you know, are out from outside of America, but what's your, first off, what's your perspective on being a pro in America? Look, it's, it's great that we get a chance to, to be playing a wonderful game of pickleball. And I, you know, it, it's obviously still in, in its infancy and it's just, just starting to, to to pop up on the scene. So I know it's becoming very popular in England. They had the British Open. I know it's becoming very popular in Sweden as well. They, I think they're having the Swedish Open at some point now in October. Uh, there's more and more tournaments coming out of Spain. You know, there's places in Germany where the people are playing. So I think it, it's just a matter of time before it's already global, but before it becomes global the way it, the way it became in the U.S., you know, um, like with everything else, I guess it originated here, so it takes a while to to get to other places. I mean, tennis was the same, and basketball was the same, and all this other sports. But uh, I think it's just a matter of time before it becomes really global, and and um, those countries will be able to to compete with us while having their players train back home. You know, right now I think it it's a must that you train in in the states. You know, to to be able to to be a high level pro and pickable. I I see that changing probably within the next. Five to ten years, I'll say. Sure. I, wow. I shouldn't forget Australia. Australia is growing very, very big as well. I, I remember at MLP there were a lot of people from Australia. I think MLP is going to extend its branch to to have an Australian league as well. So that's not a huge market. Um, yeah, it, it's just continuing to grow for sure. Yeah, absolutely. What do you, are there any other besides MLP expanding uh, internationally? Are there any other specific things you think need to happen to help pickleball grow? globally and also are you involved in in any efforts um in in growing the sport back home in romania or, or to any other countries um i i think that the necessary step are steps are being taken right now i mean it's look it's being introduced to a large group of people um everybody's got access to the equipment everybody's got access to the game the rules and everything um, there's players now, like you said, not just Americans, but players from all over the world um, competing in it. Um, 
tournaments are starting to expand a little bit more. Like I said, you have the British Open, you have the Swedish Open, we have the Indian Open. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's going to be some stuff coming out of Australia as well. They had a couple of players, and they have Andre Mick. They had a they had a, a lady player as well in, in in MLP. So I think it's it's going to continue to grow. So I think the the right things are being done. Um, in terms of myself helping to grow the game, you know, I I try to do the best I can off the court. Uh, like I said, I'll be playing 30 to 31 events this year. Uh, so I I don't really have the the four to six week block to be able to, I don't know, travel to certain places and, right. and introduce the game like some of the other people have done. And I want to give them a lot of credit for doing that. But I'm sure I'll be doing it at some point later on in my career when I'm going to be too slow to to compete with these guys. And and I'll be more than happy to give back to, to the game that's, that's gave me so much. So, um I definitely do a lot of stuff around here where I live with the community uh, in, in the Palm Beach County. Uh, I try to do a lot of stuff during uh, my tour stops. You know, we have the APP Academy that I run the day after the tournament. So a lot of, I get to meet a lot of players and I get to teach a lot of people uh, through that. We do some some other events, you know, in, in those tournaments for sponsors and for other communities around the, the country. So uh, play my part the best I can definitely short on time to to be making a full push on that but it's it's definitely in the books yeah that makes sense um last question i always like to end with is why do you love pickleball why do i love pickleball there's a lot of reasons why i love pickleball you know it it gave me the chance to compete again um it's a very fun game to play uh a lot of my friends play it um my family is really into it as well I get to meet a lot of new people through Pickleball. I get to travel to a lot of cool places and, and play Pickleball. So there's there's a million reasons to, to love Pickleball, you know. And, uh, yeah, definitely enjoying every second of, of playing Pickleball and being out on the court. So, um, And I think it's going to stay the same for a while. Absolutely. Yeah. We enjoy watching you play. And, you know, best of luck with the rest of your career, everything you have going on. I know there's a lot more great things coming for you. So I appreciate you coming on.